Hey YouTube, Joyboy here. So, ever since we got the sun god Nika, I've just wondered if Nika is part of some kind of pair. This theory isn't new, but I think that my explanation will be. But yeah, let's begin with the sun god Nika and the symbol of the sun. It's probably most recognizable with the fishmen, particularly the sun pirates. As a society, their overall dream seems to be to forge a path to the sun, which basically means to live under the sun with everybody else, as their ancestors did. I'm also sure that everyone is familiar with the dawn. The dawn is the sunrise associated with the minks and the kozuki. But some less known connections, the original name of One Piece in its various one-shot forms was Romance Dawn. It's also the title of chapter one. And in the actual story, Luffy was born and raised on Dawn Island. And you actually see the symbol of the sun scattered throughout the story. This is one of the first theory videos I ever made about the symbol of the sun, all the various places that you find it, and its connection to the ancient kingdom. It's in a lot of places, but I don't think that the sun is the only thing that is important. So I spent many years arguing for the relevance of Binks Sake. And essentially the idea is, is that Oda encapsulates the story of One Piece and many of its themes very cleverly within the song. But in simple terms, the song describes a pirate journey, an adventure and all that entails, the romance of it, both good and bad. But in Binks Sake, the time of day is highlighted. In the first two stanzas, we learn it is the merry evening sun. The sun is out. Everything is good and the adventure is filled with dreams and hopes. But then they face adversity. Now comes a storm through the far off sky. Now the waves are dancing, beat upon the drums. But if you just hold on, the morning sun will rise. So at this point, it's nighttime, or at least dusk. And then we're introduced to the other important symbol. But don't look so down, for tomorrow night, the moon will also rise. We've argued in the past that the sun represents your dreams fulfilled. And we've argued in the past that the moon is a light during the night, which guides you to the dawn, or your dreams being fulfilled. All of this is very fitting because in the real world, the reason we see the moon at night is it reflects the light of the sun, or a reflection of your dreams. So we've argued the moon is something like hope. Whatever drives the adventurer to continue the adventure pursuing their dreams. But there's another place which shares some of the concepts that we're talking about here. Vivi's farewell speech. Vivi tells the people of Alabasta, I went on a little adventure. It was a trip in search for despair across the dark, gloomy seas. Having left my home country, the sea I then saw before me was vast. It was hard to believe just how many strong islands there were out there. Plants and animals I'd never seen, sights I'd never imagined in my dreams. The music of the waves were quiet at times, gently washing away trifling concerns. At other times they were fierce, laughing to tear apart my timid feelings. And in the midst of a dark storm, I came across a single small ship. The ship pressed me onwards from behind and said, can't you see that light ahead? The mysterious little ship that never lost its way in the darkness crossed over monstrous waves as if dancing, never defying the sea, and yet the ship's bow always heading straight ahead, even through headwinds. And then it pointed a finger out. Look, the light is right there. I am pretty sure that the vast majority of you don't need me in order to read this and realize this is important. Foreshadowing everywhere. There's a lot that could potentially be said, but we'll keep it relatively focused. Despite Luffy being the sun god Nika in Vivi's speech, the strats actually represent the moon. They are the guiding light in the night leading Vivi to the distant light, which is the sun or the dawn. Or an alternate interpretation, which is just as valid, is the strats are simply pirates who rekindle Vivi's hope. The distant light that they are pointing to is the moon. They are following its guidance, even though Vivi herself could not see. She lost her hope. The strats ship carry Vivi along a path to fulfill her dreams, which did actually happen. Perhaps to make this even more clear, you can look at the Golden Belfry from Skypea. They called it the Light of Shandor. The sound of the bell or the light is meant to guide. It also represents the moon. And the message that Roger inscribed on the pillar is very fitting. But I suggest that you read chapter 289 titled Full Moon. The reason that the chapter has this name is that in it, Nolan rekindles Kalgura's hope. This hope gives Kalgura the strength to fight against his gods. It is also fitting that chapter 292 is titled To Meet Like the Half Moon Hidden by Clouds. In the chapter, Kalgura failed to uphold his promise of ringing the bell, the light of Shandora, because it was lost. 
hope was lost. The moon is hidden by clouds. So like I said earlier, the sun is a very important symbol in One Piece, and it's really only rivaled by the moon. In the original versions of One Piece, the one-shot versions, the villain was Crescent Moon Galley. One of the first villains in the actual story of One Piece was Black Cat Kuro. We learn in chapter 28, titled Crescent Moon, that Crescent Moon Knights do something to him. They bring out the beast in me, he says, which is very reminiscent of the Minks 800 chapters later. But as a very strong contrast to these examples, you have something like the Kozuki, or in fact, all the daimyo names in Wano. Shimotsuke means Frost Moon. Uzuki means Rain Moon. Fugetsu means Wind Moon. Amatsuke means Heaven Moon. And of course, Kozuki means Light Moon. The only daimyo that doesn't have a name related to moon is Kurozumi, which means black charcoal. And I personally think that it does actually allude to moon, essentially a sky without a moon, a new moon. Perhaps opposite of Kozuki, the light moon, or maybe the full moon. If you look closely on the symbol on Orochi's kimono, you see what, I mean, it could be described as black light. I believe that the reason that the daimyos were given names or have names related to moons is that they represent guardians of Wano during the night. Wano's hope. Vessels which guide their followers to the dawn. Essentially the same as Vivi describes the Straw Hats. But while we're talking about characters from Wano, you have Toki's prophecy. Uh, and she says things in kind of ambiguous terms, but with everything that I've said already, it becomes very clear what it means. You are like the moon who knows not of the dawn. It could mean hope without direction. Or it could imply, like the moon, the people of Wano are forever chasing their dreams, but can't actually capture it. There's folklore in Japan which describes the moon as forever chasing the sun, and this will become relevant in a future video. If there's one ardent wish that can be fulfilled, then it shall be when nine shadows are cast, woven together through twenty years of moonlit nights. Only then shall you know the radiance of dawn. So the moonlit nights refers to, again, moonlit is hope, they're striving for something, but it's awful, which relatively describes the state of Wano. The nine shadows cast woven together will show the people of Wano the radiance of dawn. They will fulfill their dreams. And that happened. Toki describes them as shadows because shadows are created from those basked in light. Shadows like the moon can be seen because they are a reflection of light. The shadows are woven because they share the same dream or the same hope, the same light source. But anyway, let's go back. There's a certain dichotomy with how the moon is portrayed in the story. On the one hand, you have Kuro, who gets violent under the crescent moon. And then you have the hope interpretation. I think that a different word you could use to sort of describe the metaphorical meaning of the moon is desire. To be very precise, the moon as the light in the dark is the thing that drives people forward. And while hope and desire don't mean the same thing, they're synonyms, and can be that force which carries people through the night. In the last chapter, we had a word that was translated both as hope and as desire, depending on the translators, and this was talking about devil fruits. The word was nozomi, but I think that Oda chose this carefully because it can mean both, depending on context. But by subtly changing the word here, I think that you can interpret it in different ways. The moon awakens Kuro's desire, which just happens to be bloodthirsty. Hope or desire, the force which motivates people, can be different. But if you dig deeper into Kuro, you'll find that uh, Oda was very purposeful. Kuro's dawn is actually very similar to the idealized version in the story, essentially peace. Peace of mind, he calls it. That's Kuro's endgame. But the force which guides him along his journey to his dream is actually violence. Maybe you can consider this like the dark side of the moon. Maybe you'd be curious to point out that when you see the moon, crescent, half, whatever it is, the other half is still there, just not reflecting the light perhaps representing some of the more sinister aspects of the moon. And in some ways, maybe you can consider it contradictory. I do think that Oda will eventually elaborate on the dawn, and I do think that there's probably other interpretations for this sort of paradise, the end game. Basically, people like Blackbeard have dreams too, and they aren't quite the same thing as the one that the world is striving for, that the strats are fighting for. Kuro not only wants peace, but he wants this sort of selfish peace where he benefits and becomes something more than he is currently at Kaya's expense. But I don't want to go on forever. I think that you guys understand the sun, moon, very important. Oda uses it in very important speeches. Commonly, it has a lot of symbolic relevance. So from the moment that Oda introduced the sun god Nika, I considered it a huge possibility that there would be a moon god as well. Another fruit erased from history 
and renamed. A fruit that once awakened makes someone the moon god. And of course you know that the person who I think has this fruit is Blackbeard, and I think that this fruit is the Yami Yami no Mi. I do not find it to be coincidence that when Oda drew Blackbeard as a child, he very clearly drew the moon above him. So I'm pretty sure that most people are not going to have too much of a problem with this idea. Just a hunch. But I figure it can't hurt too much to try and over explain. So it's important to understand that I view the sun god Nika as like the god of the sun and of the day. Therefore I see its opposite as the god of the moon and of the night. These things are combined. But this dynamic I've created not coincidentally gives us a god of the day and a god of the night, which is similar to, and I think foreshadowed by the Minx in Mokomo Dukedom, a ruler of the day and of the night. The Minx have passed down a little bit of the Void Century in the structure of their society. It should also not go below your notice that when we first meet the Minx, Inarashi and Nekamumushi are in conflict. A feud of day and night. Oh yeah, didn't we just call the daimyos of Wano guardians of the night? With names relating to moons? The nocturnal force of the Minx are called the Guardians, and I find it fitting that their duty is to guard the road Poneglyph, which points to the location of Laftail. They protect and guard the path to the dawn, and they select for or choose who to guide. Maybe because, depending on who follows the path, you could have a different outcome. But anyway, gods of the day and night, the Gomu Gomu no Mi and the Yami Yami no Mi. The Yami Yami no Mi was established as weird, from pretty much the first time that we saw it in action. It's a Logia which doesn't act like a Logia, which very much opens the door that the fruit is misclassified. And I think that we know that if it's misclassified, it's not misclassified because it's actually a Paramecia, right? It's a mythical zone, obviously. And Luffy probably needs a counterpart anyway, a sort of yin yang. Blackbeard, that fight needs to be, he needs to bring as much heat as Luffy. And Blackbeard is also the direct foil of Luffy. Most likely you can look at Blackbeard's fight with Ace a little bit differently with this sun, moon, light, darkness contrast. So how exactly does the Yami Yami no Mi's powers potentially relate to a theoretical moon god, or a god whose powers could be in some way related to the moon, as we have discussed it? We'll start with Oda's creative choice to have Blackbeard's darkness fruit be also related to gravity. The moon's abilities to influence the tides is something that is very prevalent in all cultures, mythology, and folklore. The tides are created because of gravity, the gravity of the moon. Literal darkness has no gravity. Kind of further evidence that Blackbeard fruit is mislabeled because he has the darkness fruit, not the black hole fruit. He jumps through a few hoops in order to label his darkness as gravity. Much in the same way as Luffy's Gomu Gomu no Mi was described by people around him as being not quite rubber. Another aspect of this worth discussing is that Blackbeard takes more pain than others because of his fruit. I find it less fitting for someone with the powers of darkness or the powers exclusively of night to suffer more than others. It is far more fitting when you factor in this, this concept that the moon represents hope. Having hope is painful because it's often unrequited. During the night, most people's dreams die. The moon, perhaps as this beacon of will, consumes the hopes of everyone. A fitting contrast to a god whose powers are to make dreams reality. The sun god Nika is also this god of laughter, so I could see its counterpart being like more so a god of misery. But anyway, absorbing pain makes a lot of sense to me. But let's take a step back again. We said that Blackbeard's fruit literally consumes hope, and we've used many synonyms with hope, including dreams. Blackbeard's fruit consumes dreams. This is actually confirmed in the story. You know, like the speech that Vegapunk just made that devil fruits are created by hope, desire, dreams, that sort of thing, and Blackbeard's fruit sucks them out of people. I do find it very fitting that one of the first techniques that Blackbeard demonstrated in his fight against Ace was called liberation. He sucked everything in with Black Hole and then liberated it and released it as a massive pile of wreckage to illustrate that these fruits are a pair, the other side of the coin. But of course, the vast majority of Luffy's abilities with his Devil Fruit weren't apparent until he awakened it. So I presume that the same will be true for Blackbeard. But there's a noteworthy wrinkle in all of this. So I spent a decent chunk of this video pretty much arguing that the moon represents hope. And this aspect is not really clear when looking at the Yami Yami no Mi currently. But I want to remind you of my more precise definition. The moon is the guiding light, the force which leads people to the dawn. For everyone, this can be different. We don't all dream for the same things, and we aren't all motivated in quite the same way. 
So it's not just about hope, it's about desire, will. Following the guidance of the moon is a lot about ambition. The sun is the achievement of your dreams, while the moon leads you there. And you'll notice that even though Blackbeard is a foil to Luffy, there are some similarities. For one, just the same as Luffy, he believes in dreams. It's not all darkness, he has a bit of romance. So my headcanon is, is that Blackbeard's fruit will work much like Kuro and the moon, unlocking the innate desire within others, and likely within himself, as opposed to inflicting your desire or your imagination upon others. This is both good and bad. You can think of it like Mink Sulong, incredible power bringing out people's primal nature, most probably at a cost, perhaps the same cost as Mink Sulong, which is death, eventually. But anyway, just so that we're abundantly clear, you understand the difference between the sun and the moon. The moon shows people the way. The sun is the destination. Luffy's awakening allows him to change the world as he sees fit. It's almost selfish and authoritative if you didn't know who Luffy was as a person. I could see Blackbeard having something like a, a corruption type ability, where he shows people the way to their individual destinations. He doesn't achieve their dreams, he gives people the strength to pursue them. Then the cool concept here would be individual wills versus the will of the people. The night as opposed to the day is characterized as extremely dangerous. Most fail, so individual strength matters. It's a contest. The Sun God to me is an entity which fights for those who cannot fight for themselves. It kind of changes your interpretation of Blackbeard's line that dreams don't die, because some dreams do die. The dawn that's coming is not going to fulfill everyone's dreams. Instead, it should be more of a best fit sort of solution, a future which benefits most, not all. The new world of the dawn will be created in the image of the will of the people, not of a person. So you could see how Blackbeard and the Moonfruit could become the champion of the individual, while Luffy and the Sun God becomes the champion of everyone. And these things aren't the same. As a more sort of concrete prediction, I wouldn't be surprised if Oda throws a curveball that's gonna catch the majority of the community off guard. Essentially, Blackbeard expresses that he is also fighting for freedom. But I do love thinking about the yummy yummy no me in this way because the moon is a reflection of light, so there has to be some positive. There is light within the dark, a lesser incomplete reflection. Anyway guys, I know that this is a relatively popular theory. I know that Animac of Anime Uproar essentially speculated this idea, but I still feel like my interpretation is different. But I still feel like this video needs something, so let's continue. We now have two god fruits. We have a sun god fruit and we have a moon god fruit. I believe that there is a third. Let's go back to Bink Sake and point to another thing which could become something more important. You have day, right? The merry evening sun. Then there's a transition. Now comes a storm through the far off sky. Vivi says something similar, and in the midst of a dark storm. We talked about this a little bit referring to the title of chapter 292. To meet like the half moon hidden by clouds. Essentially the point is, is that a storm can hide both the sun and the moon. It's consistently described as a thing which can interfere with light. It's not the night which leads adventurers astray, it is the storm. Again, as a sailor, it's not the night that you fear, it's the hurricane. This is reflected in the Wano arc. At the end of Act 2, they're, we're filled with hope, right? The plan is about to begin, and Oda describes the sky as crystal clear, and someone even remarks that they'll be able to see a full moon. But at the very beginning of Act 3, a storm arrives from a far-off sky, and their hope is shattered. To continue in the midst of the storm would be suicide, but they do so anyway because they are samurai. Suicide is within their nature. It's romanticized in kind of the same way that pirates are. They understand the risks and the dangers, but they brave the storm anyway. And on the precipice of defeat, they encountered a ship which would guide them, which would point to the light, which would show them the way. So we now have three important symbols. We have the sun, we have the moon, and we have the storm. And I think that Oda has based these choices off of mythology and folklore. But how do we find the right one? When in doubt, choose religions and mythologies you know Oda is familiar with because it comes from his homeland. The symbol of the sun and moon are as important in Japan as it is for the story of One Piece. So let's base our gods on the traditional belief system of Japan, Shinto. The creation gods in Shinto are Izanagi and Izanami, life and death. They molded the world and are credited with creating the eight great islands. 
But anyway, Izanami and Izanagi developed the world and from them spawned many gods. Or Kami. The era of creation though comes to an end with the birth of the fire god Kagatsuchi. Izanami, the mother of the world, dies giving birth to this god. A mother dying during the birth of the fire god. You should be thinking about Ace. It's also noteworthy that Oda gave Ace daddy issues when Kagatsuchi, after killing the mother from birth, is killed by his father. And overall, the fire god's death is an important era ending event. Afterwards, his body becomes several volcanoes. There's more story after this, but let's skip ahead. From Izanagi, or life, spawned the three precious children. If you've seen Naruto, you should be familiar with a lot of these names. Amaterasu, or the sun god, Tsukiyomi, or the moon god, and Susano, or the god of the sea, and of storms. These three gods, along with Izanami and Izanagi, are the most important in traditional Shinto belief. And these three rule over heaven. As you can probably guess, I think that these are the three god fruits in one piece. Day, sun, night, moon, sea, storms. But similar to One Piece, you have lore within Japanese mythology of the sun disappearing and the world ruled by night. But it is actually not Tsukiyomi who is responsible for this. It's Susano. As far as I am aware, Susano is the only thing that Amaterasu feared. First banished from heaven, not because he committed any crime, but because of his violent temper. After being banished, he's tricked by Amaterasu and this leads him to commit a great crime. And ultimately, he is responsible for plunging the world into darkness. Just like being sake, it's the storm which is the transition between day and night. But Susano, more than any of the other gods, is characterized as chaos. It's not inherently good or bad. And after it committed this crime, it set out to atone for its sin. And it did, eventually being granted the privilege of being able to guard the gates of the underworld. But a lot of Susanoo's story reminds me of Zunisha. Commits a great crime, is exiled, forced to wander, then atones. Regarding Japanese society though, Susanoo uh, eventually became described as, or represented, those that opposed rule. Much the same as pirates. Amaterasu was actually closely linked with the royal family, and those of royal blood claimed to be descendants of Amaterasu or the sun god. And we haven't said anything about Tsukiyomi, but Tsukiyomi was the closest thing to evil of the three. Eventually, he was also banished. In regret, he forever chases Amaterasu across the heavens, unable to ever reunite. A sort of eternal hope. But as Law says in One Piece, the D bring a storm, so they seem linked to the god of the sea, or Susano. I also see the sea as the gate leading to the underworld. And this can interrelate with actual pirate lore with Davy Jones' locker. Davy Jones being the devil of the sea, which takes souls to its depth. But anyway, with the emphasis on the symbols of sun and moon and storm in the story, and we have a sun god fruit, and it's very easy to speculate a moon god fruit, I do think that there will be a third god fruit, and that will be the god of the sea. And it's very easy to speculate that this fruit may belong to dragon or to emu. But while dragon is probably the easier of the two speculations, and probably what most people would take away from this video, I do really think it might be Emu. Susano, kind of the same as Emu right now, is heavily associated with powerful weapons. I also can more easily believe Emu as the ruler of the underworld, the guardian of the gates between life and death. And it really helps that I believe that Emu might have been a former pirate, who is overall more complicated than it might seem currently. And like the personification of the storm from Pink Sake, Emu is the one in the world who is erasing lights. Once awakened just the same as Blackbeard or Luffy, you would see it become a mythical zone. And I would expect that this fruit is actually the most powerfully destructive fruit in the series. But of course, you can take this further if you want to. As of the last chapter reaction, I made a theory that Luffy's Gomo Gomo no Mi was the first devil fruit. And following this lore, you could perhaps speculate that the sun god Amaterasu is the creator of all devil fruits. One of those things that just makes a ton of sense is you have this special tree in One Piece called Sunlight Eve Tree. The roots extend all the way to the bottom of the ocean where they give light to Fishman Island. Maybe something that not a lot of people would understand, but in most traditional mythologies across the world, it's typically the moon, which is uh, portrayed as feminine or female, while the sun is masculine or male. But in Shinto, it's very uniquely reversed. Amaterasu is female. And in one piece, you have the Sunlight Eve tree. 
So if the Gomu Gomu no Mi or the Nika Nika fruit, the Sun God fruit is the original fruit and you have a sunlight tree in the story, it's very possible that this is the devil fruit tree. At the very least, the location is very fitting because we know that the Sunlight Eve tree, the roots extend to Fishman Island, so the tree must exist close to Mary Joa. But how it could it make sense that devil fruits are associated with the power of Amaterasu? Is that Amaterasu is the god of creation, a role that she inherited from her father, Izanagi. While it was originally intended that the three precious children, the three noble children, would rule over heaven together, Tsukiyomi and Susanoo were cast out. But the story goes is that after Izanami's death, Izanagi missed her and traveled to Yomi or the afterlife in order to see her and bring her back. It didn't go well. Due to various circumstances, Izanami became hellbent on destroying life. So Izanagi trapped her there using three peaches. He then declared the peach fruit to be divine and bade it to grow in the land of the living to help people in need. These were fruit first created in Yomi or the Underworld. I think that these were the three original devil fruits. In the story of One Piece, the fruits of Amaterasu, Susano, and Tsukiyomi. Perhaps all three of them have a corresponding tree. The Sunlight Eve tree, for instance, being Amaterasu, but Treasure Tree Adam, for instance, being that of Susano or Tsukiyomi. So there are three devil fruit trees, but only one of these trees naturally produces new fruit the tree of creation or the sun tree but anyway that's what i had to say as always i'm curious as to what you guys think leave your thoughts in the comment section below remember to check out my book the booms volume one links in the description as well as pinned in the comments like subscribe click the bell to be notified join the squad and as always guys have a wonderful day